So the exhibition, The Murmur of Bees, or Cronin Namak, it came about a few years ago because it starts like all good stories with just one little thing and then it gets embellished. So um, the first thing we were offered was the loan of the Harry Clark St. Gubnish drawing and it was for the window in the Honan Chapel in Cork. And um, the previous head of collections, Dr. Audrey Whitty, who's now the director of the National Library of Ireland, she had worked out in Corning Museum of Glass and she had taken a particular interest in this, um, this drawing that he did. And so she facilitated a loan and we were going to put the exhibition, was going to be about the drawing, but I felt that it would also be um, about bees as well and we'd supplement that with bees and honey. And I loved the name Cronin the Mock, which is the murmur of bees, and it's an Irish expression. So I figured we'd call the exhibition um, The Artist and the Murmur of Bees. And the first phase was going to be Harry and Gubnish, and the second phase was going to be um, Alice and the Dress of Bees. But these are just the ideas. And once you start and you look into something and you do the dialogue and collaborate, it changes totally. So I mentioned that I'd like a few bees for the exhibition to um, our entomologist, Dr. Aidan O'Hanlon, and he was just, within 10 minutes of talking to him, I was so enthusiastic about, I learned so much facts about bees that I really didn't know. And I was so amazed and I just said, and he was so enthusiastic. I said, well, why don't you do half, take half the room? You've got 12 meters or 14 meters and you can do whatever you want. And why don't you just do an exhibition on bees and we'll do the folklore on the other side. So that's how um, Aidan, came about and um, came on to the project. And in the meantime, Tiernan Gaffney had started as a folklife curator and he had a great, he'd just come from the folklore department in UCD, knew all the stories about St. Gubnit and as a result, he was so interested in doing it. And, um, and as a result, it was then co-curated by both Aidan and Tiernan and the designer that they worked with was a local um, architect called Aidan Conway and um, he's in Castle Bar and the themes came about with that lovely we took from the drawing like the Harry Clark drawing is totally different from the window it's all colors of honeys and mellow kind of shades and warm colors the eventual window that is in the Honan Chapel is all blues and purples and totally different. But we took our cue from those honeyish colours and you can see throughout the museum um, exhibition galleries, there are, um, we have like, we have a lot of that, that lovely curtain. There's a curtain of um, honey coloured curtain throughout. And we also use a green fabric as well. And that's because one of the books we have from 1903 on beekeeping in Ireland, um, that actually had a lovely green and gold cover. And these are the sort of ways that the exhibition comes about. But really, it's when people work together and between Tiernan, and Aidan and Aidan, there was so much collaboration and so many ideas and there was a real stress to make sure that we didn't overload this with text and I think that really works for a lot of people and you know there isn't there is information there but it is a visual experience and you will learn so much about the bees but it's even the little small little did you know that bees like you know communicate through interpretive dance these sort of little small things we don't have to tell the whole story but we're going to have a bibliography up online about it but i think it's just good that people don't feel overwhelmed with lots and lots of text and um, and what we plan to do with this exhibition is make sure because we want it to be sustainable we'll probably keep downstairs for the about on display for two years and we'll keep changing the upper part. So at the moment, the first thing was the Harry Clark drawing and of St. Gubnish and the patron saint of bees. And then secondly, what we plan now for the winter of 24 is um, Alice Meyer's dress of bees. It was, it's 30 years old since, 30 years ago since Alice Meyer created a wonderful childlike dress um, just um, in the, a kind of a shaped um, dress of bees and they're like 
hand sewn onto a kind of a shape of a dress so it's a little sort of child's dress made out of bees and it's really beautiful and at the time as well she did um, a print called Swarm and again with the bee dress in it and so we're going to have those on display and I think that will be a major, we'll have them on loan from the Ulster Museum actually and um, the dress is coming on loan and hasn't been on display for many many years so it's a real opportunity for for the art community and anyone who's studying art to see such a fantastic object. We're looking forward to this exhibition continuing and it really is a very popular exhibition and um, people really like it and I think it is it is fascinating to see the amount of bees that we have in Ireland. Um, if you thought you knew you've seen a bumblebee you probably you're not sure it's one of 16 of the species in Ireland so fascinating and uh, and really really great for uh, for families and for students and for anyone who loves um, loves art and and folk life and stories so um, please come along enjoy it Cronin the mock and the murmur the murmur of bees Hi everyone, I'm Aidan O'Hanlon, I'm the Entomology Curator with the Natural History Division of the National Museum of Ireland and a co-curator co of the Murmur of Bees exhibition um, which looks at bees and their influence on the Irish ecosystem and on Irish um, society as well. Um, so what visitors will see when they come to visit Murmur of Bees, first of all is they'll learn that there are more than a hundred different bee species native to Ireland and people are often uh, surprised to find that we've got more than the honeybee and the familiar bumblebees um, but there's over a hundred different species. Most of them don't nest in big communal groups. Only one makes honey. Um, some of them are little thieves. They sneak into each other's nests and steal the food. Um, they're parasites. There are some species that only live in Ireland or subspecies that only live here and seem to have evolved here. Um, so there's some research to be done on that. Um, there's a species that is so rare that it now only lives in County Mayo in the west of Ireland. And it used to be quite widespread, um, but it's been, it's been in decline. Um, so you'll see examples of that here. Um, there's a species that only makes its nests in snail shells and you'll see examples of that. Um, apart from that, apart from the diversity of bees, I suppose visitors will learn about um, their important role in nature. So they're important pollinators, obviously, of our crops um, and of our wild plants. Um, apart from that, they will learn about their kind of role uh, in the wider ecosystem as prey for predators. So people will be surprised to learn that a whole bunch of different animals are dependent on bees as a food source. So um, things like badgers will dig up bumblebee nests and we'll see that here. Um, the brown bear, which is famous in America as a subspecies, the grizzly bear, but they used to live here um, and they went extinct about 500 BC. But they have a very broad diet, but it included um, honey from beehives. So that idea of Winnie the Pooh loving honey is based in reality and they still do it in some parts where the brown bear exists. Um, so we'll see predators of bees, some birds that eat bees, insects that invade bee nests and, um, and eat bees and eat larvae, larval bees. Um, visitors will also learn the differences in different um, bee nests, I suppose, so they'll learn the difference between a bumblebee nest and a, and a bee hive. Um, and they'll see that in, in comparison with other similar social insects like ants and wasps as well, just to see that they're similar, but it's kind of a variation on a theme. So yeah, there's more than 100 different bee species native to Ireland. Um, and when I say different species, I mean they're as different from one another as a magpie is from a seagull or a buzzard or something like that. So they're all part of the same group, but they're, they're totally different, of different lifestyles, um, even different broad categories. So for example, there's the mining bees, and these are solitary bees. So we think of bees that live in, in beehives and they have social behavior and a queen and workers and so on. Most bees are solitary, and um, mining bees nest in, in the ground. Um, one species of mining bee was actually thought to be extinct for 100 years, and it was recently discovered in Kilkenny. And it seems to be spreading in recent years, which is great news. There's also the plasterer bees and the yellow face bees. Again, most of these are solitary and they make their nests in little holes in, in stems and so on. Um, one of these species only recently got to Ireland. It's a species called the ivy bee, which was only last summer discovered in, in County Wexford and Wicklow and seems to be spreading up the east coast. So this is something that naturally colonized from Britain, maybe increasing its distribution north with climate change. And we've got the first specimens of those on display in the exhibition. So there's also the furrow bees and the blood bees, and blood bees are called blood bees because they have this big red, blood red abdomen, so they kind of look like wasps, but they've this big red abdomen, and they're, they're not as hairy as other bees. 
um, and they lay their eggs inside the nests of other bees. So they're kind of uh, they're what we call kleptoparasites. They'll steal the food off the larvae. Um, they're from an overall group called the sweat bees, um, and they're, they're so-called because tropical species of these little bees are apparently they're attracted to people's sweat. Um, in Ireland, we've got mostly uh, furrow bees from this group. Um, so they'll again they'll make their nests in in kind of uh, south facing soily banks um, in a, in a sunny spot. Um, there's also then leaf cutter bees. Uh, so they will they get their name from chopping up a bit of leaf with their mandibles and they'll roll it up into a kind of a cigar shape and they'll stuff it into a hole in a wall or a tree. Um, so these are kind of kinds of things that you would attract with uh, with one of these popular bee hotels. Um, and from that same family, there are other kind of trickier bees called sharp tailed bees. And they're so-called because they have this big sharp tail and they'll sneak into the nest of a leaf cutter and they'll inject their own eggs into the leaf cutter's nest and they'll hatch before the leaf cutter bees do and they'll steal the food from the larvae. There's also the, the nomad bees and carpenter bees. So we don't have any native carpenter bees, but we have a species, the violet carpenter bee, that shows up once in a blue moon when the weather's really good. The one that's on display in our exhibition was actually um, found in County Tipperary two summers ago, and it was found in a trampoline and handed into the museum. Um, so these species, again, when the weather's just right, they'll blow over, they'll get the prevailing winds over from either northern France or southern Britain and they'll spend the summer in Ireland, but it's probably too cold for them to nest here. And there are also the bumblebees, which most people will be familiar with, but they might be surprised to learn that there are about 20 different species of bumblebee native to Ireland. Some of them are very common, like the very large um, Bombus terrestris, the buff-tailed bumblebee that people will see flying around the garden. It's the, the biggest bumblebee that we have in Ireland. Some of them are very rare as well, so there's a species called the great yellow bumblebee that used to be fairly widespread across Ireland. It was never that common. But now it's, it's, uh, its distribution has been reduced to only a few pockets in, in County Mayo where there's conservation efforts to, to preserve the last populations of them here. Then there are cuckoo bumblebees, which are fake bumblebees. So bumblebees, like the honeybee, they have a queen and workers and males all in a, in a colonial nest. But the uh, cuckoo bumblebees only have females and males, so they don't have queens and workers. And what they'll do is they'll sneak into the nest of a real bumblebee and the female will lay her eggs inside the nest and the real bumblebee workers will be tricked into thinking that they're rearing their own sisters or workers from the new nest. Um, all the while the cuckoo bumblebee will go and sting the real queen to death. Um, and then from the same family then of course there's the honeybee which people are probably mostly familiar with. So the honeybee is the only bee that we have in Ireland that produces honey that people can harvest and um, that beekeepers keep. Um, so the honeybee is an incredibly uh, intelligent social species so they live in these huge colonies and um, they fly around gathering nectar and and pollen from plants which they feed to their young um, and through this process they'll regurgitate the nectar into the wax cells that they make within their nest um, which evaporates and then it solidifies into a nice treacly honey. Um, so honeybees are the only species as well that, that are managed by people so they're managed by beekeepers in hives. Honeybees are also the only species that can that will die after stinging you so bumblebees could probably sting you as much as they wanted to and um, they just tend to be a little bit more chilled out. Honeybees have a sting mainly to um, protect against predators, so things, animals like uh, mammals and birds that might come and attack a nest. So think of something like a grizzly bear. Um, we used to have brown bears, which is the, the parent species in Ireland, and bees will have this, this swarming behavior where they'll all attack uh, in unison to protect the hive. And for this reason, a lot of animals uh, that are totally harmless, a lot of insects that are harmless, have evolved colors that mimic the sort of stereotypical yellow and black stripes of, of a bee or a wasp. Um, and you'll see examples of this on display, this is called mimicry, where harmless animals will, will mimic a harmful animal. They'll all evolve towards the same general shape or colour to avoid predators. And so people will often wonder, you know, they'll hear this concept about saving the bees or that bees are in decline. Um, and in Ireland, about 30% of our 100 or so species have been assessed as being threatened uh, to some degree or another with extinction. Um, thankfully, there's a, a great initiative called the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, uh, which is managed by our colleagues in the National Biodiversity Data Centre and that's set up to provide habitat spaces to allow uh, bees and other pollinated, pollinating insects to survive and thrive. Um, people might be familiar with the, uh, the painting of a, of a garden bumblebee that you see in areas it might say something like managed for wildflowers, managed for pollinators and we've got the original painting of that on display downstairs as well.
how's it going? My name is Tiernan Gaffney. I'm one of the assistant keepers here at the Natural Museum of Ireland Country Life and I'm one of two curators who worked on the Murmur of Bees, a new temporary exhibition that explores bees influence on our culture and our natural world. The first display that you'll see downstairs um, as you walk down the stairs on your left hand side is uh, bees in everyday life and what we're trying to do with this display is show that bees are, you know, they can provide us with far more than just honey. Uh, for example, they can provide us with mead, um, or we can use honey to make mead. It's also known as honey wine. The term honeymoon is said to come from a tradition of drinking mead or honey wine for a full month or full moon cycle after one gets married. And then there's also the Chok Midhorta, uh, the Hill of Tara, which is, uh, translates to uh, mead circling house. The idea behind that being when the king drinks from the mead or drinks the mead as he passes it around, you have to drink modesty and as it comes back to the king, he should still be able to take a sup as well. Um, so it travels all the way around the banquet hall um, for the king to be able to have two soaps from the meter. Then also, you know, we use honey in different health products. We use uh, beeswax for things like wrapping food. Beeswax is also used to make altar candles. Bees have a very important part in religion all across the world. Um, in Ireland, uh, Ratborn Candles, who are the oldest candle making company in the world, still make altar candles using beeswax. There's an old story that when Christ was crucified, the tears that fell from his eyes became honeybees, and that's how bees were introduced into the world. Um, next up, you'll see a wooden beehive made by a man named John Gallagher from Balik in County Fermanagh. So he first received a hive of bees in the boot of a car as a gift and he was asked if he wanted to start beekeeping and he said yes and he built 10 of these wooden hives. It's the most common hive that you'll see, that you'll see still used in Ireland today and throughout the world today, um, the wooden beehive. It was donated by his sister, uh, Sister Patricia, who was a nun who donated it after he passed away. And you'll also see his smoker on display as well and the smoker is basically used to make the bees docile or to make them drowsy so the beekeeper is actually able to take the, the honey frames out of the hive. Next up, you'll find um, bees in education and bees in childhood. So you'll see a miniature of a Lego beehive made by a school teacher named Rory O'Lockoin. Um, and he holds the world record for largest interlocking plastic brick beehive. Um, he did that during the 2020 COVID lockdown. And if you scan the QR code you'll see on display, you'll be able to see the hive live in action. Uh, one of the first things that children are introduced to um, are bees when they're learning about things like say cow, dog, cat, bee is in there. So we've included some different books and children's books on bees, uh, Winnie the Pooh. Um, you'll see, find him in the exhibition and you'll find lots of different things for children to enjoy and understand how bees are connected with childhood. The next window again is a, a shrine that we've tried to recreate um, in dedication of St. Gubnet, who the exhibition was kind of built off. St. Gubnet is Ireland's patron saint of bees and the most popular story associated with St. Gubnet is invaders were coming to Ireland and they were coming to you know, steal everybody's cattle and to burn the place down and St. Gubnet held up her beehive and out from the beehive loads of bees flew and attacked all the invaders and stung them and scared them away. In other versions of the story the bees actually become soldiers themselves and a great battle happens and the invaders move away then as well. So this story is actually illustrated in the um, Harry Clark drawing that we have of St. Covenant that he did in 1915 um, and that was a template that he used for his window in the Holland Chapel in County Cork. So you'll actually see that story at the bottom of the drawing and then at the top of the drawing you'll see another story um, associated with the plague fields. So the plague was coming to Ballyvorney in uh, County Cork where St. Covenant's church is and she was able to contain it within one field so not to destroy all the crops of the, the local people there. The next one though you'll see is um, bee skeps. So these are conical straw houses for bees basically and they were made using sugon rope which is straw that's twisted together and coiled together up into a conical shape and the bees basically um, put the honeycomb in from and the top and worked their way down towards the bottom. But the thing about bee skeps was they were very impractical because in order to actually harvest the honey you had to kill the bees, quite often burn something like sulfur near them and then in order to take the honey out you actually had to kind of rip apart the skeps. So the skep was destroyed and the bees were dead so it was a very um, you know, disastrous way to keep bees, but thankfully when wooden beehives were introduced it was far more renewable and a far more eco-friendly way to keep bees. Next to the bee skeps you'll find a book that we have on loan from the Royal Irish Academy. Um, it's Instructions for Managing Bees. It's the first ever book published on beekeeping in Ireland and it's got some quite interesting uh, guidelines for how to keep bees. Um, one of them, for example, is there's a bird called a tomtit that will come down and just wait outside the hive and it'll eat 20 or 30 bees and then it'll fly off and do the same thing again the next day and it gives the, you know, the advice that the best way to handle this bird is with a gun. And then the chapter ends. 
Next to that, you'll see lots of different honey pots and honey jars from the museum's collections, from our art and industry collection, um, and from our folk life collection. You'll find a beautiful Balik honey pot that's decorated like a beehive, and underneath you'll see it has Balik's second mark, and it's slightly faded, and it, there's a belief that Balik's second mark is slightly faded because there was a shortage of materials during World War I, so they weren't able to use as prominent um, inks to put on their pottery. Then next to that you'll see a Carrick Macross lace collar, that won second place at um, the RDS Art Exhibition in 1912. So um, a lot of people know that Carrick Macross lace and different types of Irish lace were made by the poorest women in Irish society um, and worn by kind of the highest status women um, such as you know royalty. Um, and that was a way for women to be able to provide an income for the house while you know men were say working in agriculture. There's also a lot of interesting things to do with bees and the Irish language. For example, the word kusnog means wild honey bee nest, but it also means lucky find. And this comes from the Bjokbraha, or the bee judgments. During the Brehan laws, there were the bee judgments, um, or the Bjokbraha. And basically your bees were immune from crimes committed by themselves. So for example, if you started beekeeping and one of your bees stung somebody, that person was entitled to their fair share of honey, as long as they promised they didn't kill the bee. Or for example, if one of your bees set up a hive in somebody else's garden, they were entitled to one third of its produce. Or if you found a, a wild honeybee nest in the wild, um, or a cool snoke, you were entitled to two thirds of its produce, but you had to share one third with the community and with the church. But if one of your hives, say, set up a hive in the garden of a nemid, which is basically a, per a high status person, they were entitled to its full produce and you were entitled to any produce from that hive whatsoever. There's also a lot of traditions associated with bees in Ireland. One of the most popular ones that you still hear about today is telling the bees. This idea being that when somebody dies or there's a birth or a marriage that you tell the bees about this important news. There's a quote that we have here on the floor from Rudyard Kipling from 1906 and it's marriage, birth or burying, news across the seas. All you're sad or marrying, you must tell the bees. And one of the more popular occurrences of this in recent years was when Queen Elizabeth II died, the Queen of England, uh, the beekeeper had told her that, you know, her, um, told her bees that she had passed away and that a new owner would be coming and that he would look after them. And um, that was obviously King Charles. And there's, you know, different traditions found throughout the country and throughout Europe of, you know, placing, say, black ribbon on hives to let the bees mourn with the person. And there's plenty of stories found in the National Folklore Collection of bees not being told about somebody's death and then the bees actually following the hearse or following the coffin up the road never to return again. So they're a very important part of beekeeping in Ireland, you know, is, is informing the bees and telling them about all the important news that happens.